Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope the content encourages you and helps you build your faith. Now enjoy the message. It says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Verse 25. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot, a wrinkle, or any blemish. Do you, men, do you realize that is what the Lord is saying you should present your wife as? Let, let me just back up. For, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Can I tell you something? At this point in church history, the church wasn't too fond of Jesus. There was a huge Roman revolt. I mean, they nailed him to a cross. They crucified him because they were revolting against him. Yet he's saying he loved them anyway to the point of the cross and after the cross to give them life when they did not deserve it. Husbands, you've got to love her whether or not she deserves it. Whether or not she's acted, whether or not she's earned it. Whether or not she's acting like you should be loved. You, it says right here, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. I'm called to, to lay down my life for her. To make her holy and clean. She should be holy and clean. She should be better with me spiritually than when she was without me. I should elevate her spiritually. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. I should be involved in God's word and his consecration in our lives. Verse 27. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Here you go, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Our marriage Oneness is an illustration of the oneness that Christ and the church have, that we have with Jesus. Before I, I get there, um, in my house, we made this decision, right? We, we go back and forth. We go organic, we go no GMO, we go gluten-free, and then we go to Whataburger, right? <laughs> Makes no sense to me. I, I, I fight this all the time. But it's like, oh, we've got to get the, the chicken breast that says organic and it's 10 times more a pound than, you know, what regular chicken breast is. But, oh, by the way, can we go to Whataburger? Because I really want, you know, some, some chicken and a double cheeseburger and some chicken nuggets and all. And I'm just like, well, well you, you were lecturing me about the chicken that we buy, but now you're taking me to get chicken that's, you know, probably not even chicken. Like, what are we, like, how, are we, how is this working out, right? So we go through this. I'm going to be natural. I'm going to be organic. I'm going to go to Whataburger. And we did the same thing with dishes, right? What I have here, two, two dishes. So, uh, man, you, you microwave it in plastic. You're going to get cancer, right? That was the big thing. So then, uh, uh, and all of our kids' plates were, were plastic. So we went and we bought uh, glass dishes for our kids, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a really um, environmentally safe idea to do until you, ha you ever handed a three-year-old a glass plate, <laughs> right? He's like spinning it on his hand. He's juggling it. And I'm like, oh, and of course, what happens? They drop it and it shatters everywhere. Isn't that amazing how that happens? I mean, you can take these plates these glass plates that are such a, a home-saving work, right? And then all of a sudden, in his case, he dropped them. In my case, I intentionally break them. And then here's what we wind up with. Tell me there ain't no way. Okay, I was going to say, let's do one more. How about that? Oh, it just sounds so good, right? Sounds like my child when I hand him a plate. And they break into pieces, and I'm left with all of these pieces. And so then, you, you know, you're sweeping it up, and Anna's like, there's glass everywhere. You know, it, it's amazing how when you drop a plate in the kitchen, how the glass winds up all the way up the stairs. And 
Are you with me? I'm like, what the heck? How is there glass in the upstairs bathroom, you know? We drop this thing in the kitchen, but it goes everywhere. But then after, I mean, there, it's, it's over. It's done, right? And so you have these two things, and then all of the sudden, you, you start like, if you're just looking at this, there is absolutely no way to take two broken things and make them one. There is no way. I mean, I'm looking at the mess right now, and you can't take these two shattered, broken plates, and you can't make them one. Yet this is what I feel like we try to do in marriage. We take two broken people, two people who are shattered, Two people who are tattered. And we try to, as the scriptures say, bring them to a place of oneness. There's one problem. You can't make oneness out of a broken mess, right? So if you're entering it, man, if you are not married today, this is for you. Don't be looking for that which is broken. Be looking for that which is whole. You don't want, and, and I'm not saying, hey, two broken people can't get together in marriage and make it work. I've seen that happen, and they've been redeemed, and they, they get saved, and God does the work. But I promise you, every single one of them will tell you, if I'd have had my life right with Jesus before I got in my marriage, it would have saved me so much turmoil during my marriage. Is there any married couples that would bear witness to that? Man, I wish I would even with and I wish I was even better with Christ when we first got married than we are now. But you take these broken things, right? And you try to bring them together to a place of oneness and it doesn't happen. So what do you have to do? You have to find wholeness. You have to find completeness. You have to find satisfaction. And two people that come together that are whole can make one whole thing. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And the process for it, this is what's really cool. This is where we're going to dive into some really cool theology. Is the, the process for healing brokenness in my life is Jesus. The process for healing brokenness in my marriage is Jesus. Further, there are only two relationships in Scripture that we are commanded to have oneness in. Only two. I know you can already guess them. Us with God through Jesus, oneness. Us with our spouse through Jesus, oneness. You see that? The only two relationships we're to walk in oneness in are us with, with God through Jesus and us with our spouse through Jesus. The collision comes when we start talking about salvation. The same path or stages or works in salvation are the exact same that should be modeled in our marriage. Are you ready? You're about to pass Practical Theology 101, the study of salvation. You want to get real cute, right? Soteriology on there. Here you go. There are three pieces to salvation. Now, now hear me. I am saying you are saved through faith by grace in Jesus Christ, right? That is salvation. But you'll walk through, and you'll see this through Scripture, the three different stages of being saved, I guess you you would say the three different stages that you walk through. Number one is justification. So you've, you've heard this. If you've gone to Bible college at all, you've heard justification is number one. That is freed from the penalty of sin. That is the choice to follow Jesus. I have chosen through faith to submit my life to the Lordship of Christ and Jesus is Lord and new life comes through him. That is justification. I'm freed from the penalty of sin. Stage two is sanctification. That is a process of becoming free from the power of sin. Justification, I'm freed from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, I'm in a process of becoming free from the power of sin. It's a process. It's a working out in my salvation. And, and we'll, we'll walk through this in, in Romans 5 through 8. That You, you see, I'm, I'm working out through these things in my life. I'm saved. I'm justified. And now I'm trying to become sanctified. I'm trying to become more like Jesus. I'm trying to overcome these temptations. I'm trying to, to battle and get free from these things. And then the third stage is glorification. Glorification is freedom from the presence of sin. 
So we have justification freed from the penalty of sin, sanctification freed from the power of sin, glorification freed from the presence of sin. That is a, a current yet continuing and futuristic state of I receive his glory and I'm living for his glory and I'm living for it now and I'll be living with it in eternity. That's glorification, right? Give yourselves a hand. You just passed Practical Theology 101. Here's what's incredible. Our marriages model the exact same format. Our marriages in this passage, Ephesians chapter 5, it is so clear. The same three phases we walk through, and and isn't this like God to do this? If my marriage is to model my salvation, then wouldn't it make sense that the three same stages that I walk through in my marriage, I need to be walking, I'm walking through with Jesus? Justification, sanctification, glorification. So here they are, number one, that's our outline for the day, justification. Here it is in salvation. It's Galatians 2 verse 16. It says, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We are justified by faith in Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. We are justified by a choice to follow and submit to Jesus Christ in our life. We say, it is not me, it is him. I've died to myself. I've submitted to Jesus and I have chosen through faith by his grace to be saved and to seek him. Now, Ephesians 5.21 says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 24 is a great kicker. I don't think they have it on there. He says again, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should submit to their wives. So it is, it is giving you the exact same choice in justification to choose mutual submission to each other. It starts with a choice. It starts with a choice. You say, man, I've been married for 10 years. What does this have to do with me? It has to do with you still reaffirming your choice to marry that person, to spend your life with that person, that separating from that person is not an option because you are walking in oneness with that person and you have chosen to mutually submit your life together with that person. It's the choice of mutual submission. We choose to submit to Christ and we choose to submit to oneness in our marriage. This really challenged me because for far too long, uh, I took Jesus way more serious than I took my marriage. I did. I took, and it's just, I was just being a bad husband. I mean, really. But I, I, I man, my, my time with Jesus. Nobody messed with my time with Jesus, my walk with Jesus. I was always walking with the Lord, and I loved Jesus, and I worshiped, and I prayed, and I read my Bible, and then my wife would need something from me, and I'd be like, can, can you just bother me with that later? Like, can you, I, I'm, I'm busy right now. I've got a lot going on, and, and I'm reading this, and I'm seeing the parallel so clearly in Scripture that just as Christ has justified me because I chose to follow him, I should represent that same level of submission in my marriage. My walk with Jesus should not look different than my walk with my wife. My heart for Jesus should not be different than my heart for my wife. My love for Jesus and my worship of Jesus should be modeled in my love and my care for my wife. Because just as I was justified in salvation, I have the same justification in my marriage to choose. To choose to submit. To choose to mutually submit in our marriage. So it's not just husbands, this is wives too. This is you choosing just as much as we choose to mutually submit. Just like you chose to enter into relationship with Christ in oneness, it should be reflected in your choosing to enter into marriage in your oneness. 
I had a friend who, uh, can we just, who, where's all our runners in here? Runners, wave at me. You, I mean, you enjoy it, right? Can we all, everybody else just look at those people weird, like what? Like what? Like, what? Now can we give them a hand because, you know, they're better than us. <laughs> we love the runners. I, I, the, 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 the Sam Houston cross country team used to be in here quite often. I used to, uh, yeah, still here. Yeah, give them a hand. Way to go. We love all those people that run all those miles. Great job. Great work. I was talking to them one time, and they, they had said, I said, how, how was your Sunday? And they said, great. Sunday's our long run day. And I was like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, we do it before church. And I said, well, what's long run day? Like, I don't know, 10 to 12 miles. It's like, <laughs> My lower back starts hurting when I drive 10 to 12 miles, right? I'm like, 10 to 12 miles every Do you know what I would preach like if I ran 10 to 12 miles before church? Like this. <laughs> Like this. <laughs> I had a friend who, um, I, I don't know what, well, I do know. It's actually a really cool story. He, he, I saw him at the gym uh, last week, and I mean, he was, he, was, he was literally walking like this. Oh, He couldn't sit down. He couldn't stand up. He couldn't do anything. You know, he's really, really bad shape. And I said, dude, what, what happened to you? And he said, I ran a half, mi- a half marathon last week. And I said, really? I didn't know you were a runner. He said, I'm not. <laughs> I said, what? Like, why did you, you know, like, what did you do that? You can die doing that. At least I think you can. I would die if I just went out and ran a half marathon. Yeah, I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And he said, man, he said at the beginning of the year, he said, my wife, he's, he's a great Christian guy. He said, my, and my wife, uh, she was really upset with her losing her workout habits. So I told her, hey, here's what we're going to do. You and I, we're going to sign up for a half marathon, and we're going to sign up together, and then we're going to sign up in a different city, and we'll make a little date retreat weekend out of it, and I'll book the hotel, and we'll go there, and we'll run the half marathon, and we'll go to a steak dinner, and we'll stay overnight, and then we'll come back, and we'll, we'll see the kids. And she was like, you would do that for me? And he was like, I am all in, baby. Half marathon. We're going. And so he, they did the registration together, right? And then they called his mom, came into town stayed with the kids and they you know they were preparing for this and she was training the whole time right she did couch to you know half marathon plan and was knocking out her runs and he said man I just got busy with work life got crazy I I really just forgot about it and then a week before his wife came up to him and she was like honey I am so excited for next weekend and he was like yeah awesome me too what's what's next weekend you know and she was like oh babe it's our half marathon retreat and he was like "Uh uh-oh like, can you train for a half marathon in a week? Or, and he was like, man, he, he said, I literally, I was like, oh, yeah, I love you. Like, yes, we'll go. And he said, I went to my office. He said, I sat down and I, I was looking at the registration and I was thinking to myself, can I transfer this, my registration, can I transfer it to one of her friends? Like, can I get out of it? Hey, babe, you just go on a girls weekend and here's my registration for your friend and y'all go run the marathon. And he said, as I was looking, he said, I pulled up the registration and it came up right there and I saw her name and I saw it next to my name. And I saw her signature and I saw my signature. And he said, I was so deeply convicted. I said, I put my name next to my wife on this. He said, there's no way I can't go. He said, I can't imagine myself telling my wife, hey, uh, I committed to this with you, and I said that we would do this, and you go and do it without me. So he said, I went, and I ran, and he showed me their finishing picture, right? And it it was really cool. She's running through, and she's running like this, and he's literally like this. (laughs) He was like, man, I tripped, I tripped, I tripped. But he, he said, man, he said it was the coolest thing that we crossed the finish line together. And he said at that moment, it didn't matter if one was training and one wasn't training or if one took it serious and the other didn't take it serious. It was the fact that we both said at the end, I am in this with you and I'm not quitting and I'm not giving up and I'm not stopping because I chose to be in this with you. That's the choice. You've chose to take a race with this person. And sometimes the training may go great, and sometimes the training may go terrible. But at the end of the day, your names are together in covenant with God, and you have said, I'm going to go to the finish line with you. Maybe that's the life that you need to inject in your marriage today. Maybe it's just the life of, you know what, I chose you. And I may not have been training, and I may not have been working hard, and I may not have given it a great effort, but I'm telling you, we're going to the finish line together. 
And I'm going to start training a little better. And I'm going to start working a little harder because we have chosen, just like I chose to be in a relationship with Jesus, we've chosen each other. And I'm going to take it as serious with you as I take it with Jesus. That's the justification. Now we enter into the really fun part, which is the process. Sanctification. Becoming more like Christ in our marriage. Growing in Christ in our marriage. Cultivating the image of Christ in our marriage. In John 17, 17 through 19, here it is for salvation. Sanctify them in the truth. There you have it. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. We're in a continual process of becoming more like the person that this truth tells us about. Continually, and as we read this truth and we get closer to Jesus and we grow in the process of becoming more like Jesus, that is exactly what we're to be doing in our marriage. Ephesians 5, 22 through 30. It says, For wives, this means submit to your husband as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to, their, to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. 27, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. Verse 29, no one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for For the church. And we are members of his body. This is amazing to think about. Think about this for a second. God has called us. God has called us into a relationship of oneness. He's asked us for mutual submission. But he's given us completely different expressions for that. Think about that for a second. God has called us into a relationship of oneness. He has asked for that to be in the context of mutual submission. But he has given you and your spouse completely different expressions of that. One is to submit. The other one is to love. Now, this is really important because in mutual submission, it's a mutual love. When you think of submitting, what, is it, what does it mean to submit? It means to lay down yourself for the, for the sake of somebody else. I'm submitted, I am submitting myself for the needs, the wants, and the desires of somebody else. And what does it mean to love? What, what is the example that Christ gave us for husbands to love? It means to lay down your life for her, right? So they're both mutually submitted, They're both essentially the same path in love, but the expressions are one is to submit and the other one is to love. And if one submits and one loves, they come together. Both of those roles create the dynamic of a team that is functioning from red to blue and it makes purple. The cycle becomes so clear, the sweet spot of where you're supposed to be. I I play basketball a lot. Right? I play about three or four times a week, and I play with a similar group of guys. And there was this one guy, he, he used to play with us. We finally ran him off. His name was Steve, and he just drove us crazy because here, well, he drove anyone whose team he was on crazy because Steve's 6'5. Do we have any basketball players in here? Basketball players, where are you? Where are you? Okay, a few of you. Think about th- Nothing drives me crazier than this. Steve is 6'5. He's a big 6'5". He's a bulky 6'5", right? He's a fit 6'5". He's an athletic 6'5". He's a great defender. He's got great post moves. He's got a big over the top, a real good up and under. I mean, he's a good player. All Steve wants to do is stand around and shoot threes. He's a horrible three-point shooter. The dude cannot hit. He's 15, 20% on a good day. And I mean, it is so 
frustrating because this is a guy who's got tons of potential. He's really athletic. He's big. He's strong. And he would contribute so much to the team if he'd just get under the block and do what he's supposed to do, right? Right? Problem is, he doesn't know his role. He won't listen to his role. He won't perform as he's out there launching three pointers. Like, Steve, what are you? I mean, like, why? Oh, man, I just, you know, I just want to be part of, the, part of the crew. You ain't part of the crew when you're shooting threes, Steve. Get under the block. You know, but what happens is he takes all of his size, all of his ability, and all of his talent, and it's completely wasted because he doesn't know his role. He doesn't know the position he should be playing. You, man, you may bring some great things to a marriage. You may bring an incredible sense of humor. You may bring this magnetic personality. You may bring leadership. You may bring brilliance and intelligence and budgeting and communication skills and great parenting skills and great life skills. And you may bring all of these great things to a marriage. But if you don't know how to perform your primary role, it means nothing. If you don't know how to love and you don't know how to submit, it means very, very little. But when you embrace the role in marriage that God is, and, and remember, this is mutual submission in a state of oneness expressed in two separate ways, all headed towards the same thing, oneness and love in marriage. Let me give them to you, uh, and then let me take a little twist on this for you. Ephesians 5.22, hey, don't, don't get mad at me for this. Get mad at God. This is between you and God because this is the role he's asked you to play. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.22, never seen it more clear than this. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, Ephesians 5.25. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. I tell you something. Th- that's actually really easy when both parties are doing it. Honestly. Guys, if you, if you love her like Jesus loves you and you're willing to lay down your life for her and you care for her and you'll do anything for her and you'll cultivate her spiritually and you'll, she would give up anything for you. She would do anything for you. Women, if you will just honor him, respect him, not nag at him all the time and not point out what he doesn't do, but honor him for what he is doing and you would respect him and you would honor him and you would show him some... He would love you to peace. It's, it's easy when both parties are doing it. The challenge comes when one is trying and the other is not. Or when you get the perception of, he doesn't love me like he should. He's not showing me that Jesus died for me love. Oh, she ain't respecting me. She expects me to love her. (laughs) Good luck. You better come earn this, right? Let me take you back to these verses and show you something really important. Throw up 522 real quick. You guys got 522? There you go. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord, right? Catch. I, I want you to think about what word jumps out to you. Throw up 525. It says, for husbands... This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. One more time, 522. Take us back. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. 525. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. The main focus of these verses cannot be submission and love. What? They cannot, all you hear is, God's calling me to submit. All you hear is, God's calling me to love. The main focus of these verses has to be as to the Lord and just as Christ. Now take us back, 522. The most important is as to the Lord. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. 525, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Hear me. The greatest act of worship that you can perform in your marriage, ladies, is to submit to your husband as unto the Lord. The greatest act of worship 
to Jesus that you can perform in your marriage is submission unconditionally as an act of worship to the Lord. Fellas, the greatest thing that you can do in your marriage is to love your wife just as Christ loved the church. You get the standard there, right? The standard is not them. The standard is not whether or not he deserves submission. The standard is not whether or not she deserves love. The standard is as to the Lord, just as Christ. Let me show you how this this works out. When this is your heart and this is what you want, Wayne Grudem, who is a a professor of theology, was at a a seminary in Chicago um, that was a massive seminary. It was very, very well known. He wrote systematic theology where some of these theological pieces came from. Um, Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant became this tenured professor over all of theology at this huge seminary in Chicago, and his wife had fibromyalgia. And so her body in the cold winters of Chicago was really having some major pain, major sorenesses. So they went on a vacation to Phoenix, Arizona. And when they got there, his wife, the warm weather, the, the lack of humidity, it, was, it, it began to really transform her body so much so that for the first time in 12 years, they went on a bike ride together. So they were both just crying. They're both literally the first time in 12 years, husband and wife, they're riding bikes together. And so they got back to Chicago, and Wayne Grudem said, when I saw what that weather did for my wife, I said, I've got to move her. I've got to get her to Arizona. So he called Phoenix Seminary, which was an unknown seminary at the time. They had no reputation, no anything. And you have Wayne Grudem, who's one of the biggest theologians of that time. He called and he said, hey, uh, can, do you guys have an open position for me? They said, who are you? He said, Wayne Grudem. And they're like, yeah, pick your position. What do you want? You know, like, come on. And he said, okay, I'll take whatever you got the start of the next semester. And so then he went to his wife and he said, honey, I've got this great plan, right? He said, here's what I've done. I am moving you to Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to ride bikes every day. We're going to hang out and spend our time together. You're going to feel so much better in that weather. I saw what it did for you. And she said, Wayne, have you lost your mind? She said, your career is here in Chicago. She said, you are the professor over all of theology at one of the leading seminaries in the country. You're going to leave that for some unknown Phoenix seminary? What are you doing? And he said, we got in one of the biggest fights we'd ever been in because she's trying to submit to me and I'm trying to love her. (laughs) That's a great fight. When you are in your marriage fighting for the other person, you're fighting the right way. When you are fighting for yourself, you're fighting for the wrong thing. You see where that went? She's fighting him. No, 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 no. I'm submitted to you, and I I want you to keep your career. And he's saying, I see your body hurting, and I'd lay down my life for your body, and I'll move for you just to get you where you need to go. And they're, they're so concerned with loving and submitting mutually to each other that they're literally fighting for the other person to each other. That's a good fight in marriage. That's where I want to get to when I'm fighting in my marriage. When I'm thinking, what kind of fights do I want to have with my wife. I want it to be me fighting for her and she fighting for me and we're just pushing back so much because we love the other person and we're submitted to the other person and we want the other person to succeed more than we want to succeed ourselves. That is making purple. That is creating oneness. That is the process of sanctification where I will resist myself, deny myself, die to myself for the sake of Christ. Do the same thing in my marriage. Would I do the same thing in my marriage? And then we finish here, glorification. John 17, 22, he says, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Interesting, right? 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature, glorification, and escape the world's corruption released from the presence of sin, caused by human 
desires. That's it in salvation. Here it is in marriage. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Let me run through these really quick because this is the foremost chapter on marriage in all of the Bible. There's more here on marriage than any other passage of scripture that you go to. And in this passage, four times in 11 verses, he says under reverence, verse 21, reverence to Christ, verse 22, as to the Lord, verse 25, as Christ loved the church, verse 29, as Christ does for the church. I'm telling you, the focal point of our marriage can't be myself, can't be my spouse. It has to be the glorification of Christ. It has to be getting my marriage to a point where Jesus is glorified through it. And people see my marriage and they give God glory and they say, man, maybe that's what it looks like to serve Jesus and to have a healthy marriage because it looks so much like how Christ loves me. It looks so much like how, what I read in scripture. It looks so much like what I long for and what I desire and what I want. I see it from Jesus in a marriage. You've got to know what you're cheering for. I said it earlier. You can have great communication. You can have awesome budgeting skills. You can have all of these great things in common and, and the same vacation spots and everything else. But if you don't have a vision to have your marriage glorify Jesus, you have missed the purpose of the covenant. It's not for you. It's not for them. It's for Jesus. It's to model Jesus. It's to show Jesus. My son, uh, the Super Bowl happened two weeks ago, and, and the Chiefs won. You think I was going to let you forget that? You think I was going to let you walk away from that one? It was that time, oh, yeah, well, we got a Texans fan in here. That sounds like a Bills fan. Where's a Bills fan? Is there, is there another living Bills fan around? I, know. Uh, I actually do like the Texans, except for when they play the Chiefs. And, hey, we came back from a 31-point deficit. Anyway, uh, Onto the sermon, right? So the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl, and my son, he watched the Chiefs from time to time, and the Chiefs all red at home, and away, they're red and white unis, right? Their uniform's white, and it's got some red on it. Well, my son is watching the Super Bowl, and he remembered that from the last game, and the 49ers, ironically, have all white uniforms with a little bit of red on them and gold helmets, right? So they looked similar to the Chiefs' away uniform. My son could not figure out who he was cheering for in the Super Bowl. It literally drove me nuts, especially when they were down. And then the Chiefs were down, and, and the 49ers scored a touchdown. And my son's like, ah, yeah, right. I'm like, you, you trying to test me, boy? Like, you want to trigger me right now? You know, you better learn who you're cheering for. And so we went back and forth because then he'd be like, okay, okay. But in his mind, he didn't know. And the whole time, I finally, we had to put him to bed because he was driving me nuts because he was cheering for the wrong team during the Super Bowl. He's four, but I mean, he is mine, so it makes a little more sense. Remember, no brain activity. But here's the thing. You have to know what you're cheering for in your marriage. You have to know clearly what you're cheering for in your marriage. And if you're not cheering for the glorification of Christ, you're not cheering for the primary thing. If you're not coming together saying, how can we glorify Jesus through our marriage? We have, we have chosen to be in relationship with each other. We are working through the process of becoming what Christ wants us to be in our marriage. Now, how can we glorify Jesus? How can we put him on display? How can people look at us and say, the way I feel about Jesus is the way I see their marriage? That's the theology of marriage. Everybody, thanks again for joining us. We believe God has something great for your life, and we hope this message encourages you to take the next step in your faith. Have a great week.